in a verbatim way, or you can summarize and get it all done in five minutes or less. It's your choice, and I appreciate your staying within the time so that we can have maximum time for questions. Mr. Gill. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and uh, Committee staff. You're going to have to pull the mic close. They're deliberately designed to be somewhat insensitive, so it's almost, you almost have to kiss them to make Lean them work. It. Very well. Well, thank you again for inviting me to the uh, conference hearing this morning. Uh, first, I offer my sincere condolences to the families of Agents Brian Terry and Ami Zapata. I am deeply sorry for their loss and for the grief that this ill-conceived operation may have caused. Also, I thank I Special Agent Victor Avia for his services and sacrifices in fighting the narco violence in Mexico and along the border. I can only imagine the horror of helplessly watching a brother law enforcement officer die in the line of duty. As the former head of ATF in Mexico, I also would like to apologize to my former Mexican law enforcement counterparts and to the people of Mexico for fast and furious. I hope they understand it was kept secret from me and my colleagues. Unfortunately, as a result of this operation, it is the Mexican people who will continue to suffer the consequences of narco-related firearms violence. I have no doubt, as recent media reports have indicated, that American citizens will also face more firearms-related violence as a result of this operation. I would like to provide the committee with a brief description of my background. I received a bachelor's degree in criminology from the University of Maryland, a master's degree in criminal justice from the University of Alabama. I am currently completing my dissertation at the University of Southern Mississippi, focusing on international affairs and security studies. I have been in service to our nation since my enlistment in the United States Army in 1980. After service in the Army, I joined the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and later received my commission as an ATF Special Agent in 1987. I then served for 23 years in various positions in ATF, including intelligence and assignments and as attaché to Mexico, until I recently retired. I chose ATF because it was a small organization with a focused mission, combating the most violent offenders in America. During my first 12 years as a field agent, I participated in or directed investigations that targeted the worst of the worst. For the remainder of my career, I supervised, managed, and led agents who conducted similar investigations. Throughout my career, not once, never, did firearms walk from any investigations I directed or fell under my command. This includes my services at ATF attache in Mexico. Uh, to put it bluntly, it is inconceivable in my mind or the mind of any competent ATF agent to allow firearms to disappear at all. Furthermore, it is even more inconceivable that a competent agent would allow firearms to cross an international border knowing that they are destined for the worst of the worst criminals in the Western Hemisphere. I recall my first days at the ATF Academy where it was drilled into us that under no circumstances would any firearms in any investigation leave the control of ATF. Instructors stressed that even if a weapon was lost by accident, the agent was still subject to termination. My point is that ATF agents don't allow, and ATF as an organization has not tolerated, firearms to disappear. Yet apparently that happened here. After retiring from ATF, I started receiving inquiries from former colleagues, including Special Agents Vince Sheffaloo and Jay Dobbins, as well as from the press. They all wanted to know whether I was aware that ATF had allowed uh, firearms to walk into Mexico. I advised my former colleagues that I was not aware, but I refused to speak to the media without a complete understanding of the issue. After talking with several agents, I became convinced that firearms might have been walked into Mexico by ATF. Thankfully, Congress and the and media continued to investigate, and Fast and Furious began to receive greater notoriety. Nonetheless, I remained reluctant to speak out about what I had come to suspect since retiring from ATF, but was never told about this operation. When I later learned that ATF executive staff would not make statements exonerating my former staff in Mexico of any knowledge of the gun-walking aspects of this operation, only then, then did I decide to speak to the press. My understanding is that my initial interview with Cheryl Atkinson of CBS News did have some calming effect on relations between the Mexican government and ATF personnel in Mexico. To this day, I do not understand the failure of ATF executive staff to provide their own support in this matter to their personnel in Mexico. During dissertation research, I came across a study titled The Waco, Texas ATF Raid and Challenger Launch Decision, Management Judgment and the Knowledge Analytic. The paper's title could have been substituted Operation Fast and Furious for Waco, Texas ATF Raid, and the conclusions would have been the same, namely poor management, poor judgment, and poor leadership resulted in disaster. Operation Fast and Furious is indeed a disaster. I am here today to answer the Committee's questions, but I also have a few questions of my own. For example, who actually presented this operation for implementation? What was the objective? My staff is already working with Mexico in tracing thousands of firearms recovered from crime scenes. 
Why the need to introduce even more firearms into a country besieged by narco violence? Why did ATF leadership fail to exercise oversight of this disaster? And why were ATF personnel in Mexico kept in the dark from this operation, which has now imperiled trust and cooperation between, Mexi uh, between U.S. and Mexican law enforcement at a time when trust and cooperation is more essential than ever? During my tenure in Mexico, I observed firsthand the extraordinary changes occurring there. The heads of the, agency the, heads of the agencies leading these changes are some of the bravest people I ever met. As a result of their leadership, they become targets of Mexican drug organizations. I find it grotesquely ironic that as a representative of U.S. law enforcement in Mexico, my staff and I were asked to expose ourselves and our families to the same sort of risks while speaking to our American counterparts of integrity, rule of law, honor, and duty in policing. Meanwhile, members of our own ATF and Department of Justice, for whatever reason, appear to have refused to follow the same principles. As a career special agent, I believe in the mission of people of ATF. The men and women of ATF go to work every day with a strong sense of duty. I hope that once all the facts are known about this operation, that ATF will emerge a stronger, more effective organization focused on its core mission, taking the worst of the worst armed violent offenders off the streets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Mr. Wall. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee for inviting me to speak today. I am saddened by the circumstances that bring me here today. As an employee of ATF, I know that this situation is an anomaly and not reflective of the good work that ATF does in the service of this country. And I am hopeful that this process will shed light on what has occurred so that we in ATF do not have to travel down this path again. This year marks my 26th year of Federal service and my 19th as an ATF Special Agent. During my years as an ATF Special Agent, I have been involved in hundreds of firearms trafficking investigations. These investigations date back to the early 1990s. I have seen firearms trafficked internationally from the United States to countries as diverse as the Netherlands, Canada, and Macau. These international investigations were as unique as the places to where the guns were going. However, one aspect shared by most of these investigations was the fact that most international gun trafficking is being done in the interest of organized crime. In late 2007, I became the Border Liaison Officer for the Phoenix Field Division. My duties allowed me to develop a working relationship with Mexican authorities and to travel into Mexico to examine guns or meet with officials. It was at this time that the struggle against the drug trafficking cartels was started by the Government of Mexico. Large-scale gun battles and murder became a daily occurrence in Mexico. To me and other agents, it became apparent that the level of firepower being used was more than we had ever seen. As the level of, level of firearms trafficking increased, we in the Phoenix Field Division realized that this was an arms race between the various cartels, an arms race that could very well determine the future of Mexico and tremendously impact our own country's future. Phoenix agents initiated many good investigations during this time. These investigations served to disrupt the trafficking of guns and prevented them from reaching Mexico. But the urgency displayed by the agents in stopping these gun traffickers was not apparent in the prosecution of these cases, as we saw some of our best trafficking cases languish at the U.S. Attorney's Office. In an effort to do more against this tide of weapons, in the fall of 2009, I transferred to the newly opened ATF Field Office in Tijuana, Mexico. There I worked closely with ATF and other agents. I also traveled to some of the most heavily fought for areas of Mexico. In these contested areas, I examined hundreds of firearms. Among these, I examined some that can now be traced to the Fast and Furious investigation. The majority of these firearms had been seized from criminals engaged in drug trafficking, kidnapping, extortion, and other crimes. Having firsthand knowledge of the reality in Mexico, I was skeptical when the first whistleblower came to this committee with allegations of hundreds, maybe thousands of guns being allowed to walk into the country of Mexico. I could not believe that someone in ATF would so callously let firearms wind up in the hands of criminals. But it appears that I was wrong, that hundreds and quite possibly thousands of guns have been allowed to reach the hands of organized crime in Mexico and that this activity has seemingly been approved by our own Justice Department and ATF management in the misguided hope of catching the big fish. Having had enough experience with gun trafficking investigations, I can only imagine that once the DOJ OIG report was released, a report that was critical of ATF efforts in stopping gun trafficking, 
The emphasis changed to following the food chain up to the leaders. What the persons approving this debacle failed to realize is that the end does not justify the means. These firearms that are now in the hands of people who have no regard for human life pose a threat to all of us, a threat to which none of us is immune. I am especially concerned for the brave law enforcement officers and military in Mexico and here in the United States. I fear these firearms will continue to exact a terrible toll long after these hearings are over. Finally, I have a request of this committee that the serious problem of gun trafficking not be forgotten. I don't believe we need another toothless law. What we need is vigorous enforcement and prosecution of those that would traffic in firearms, a policy of no tolerance for straw purchasers, and a change in the sentencing guidelines that would dictate mandatory sentences for these crimes would go a long way in curbing this criminal activity. I thank you. Thank you. Special Agent Canino. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee for inviting me to speak today. I want to thank you for taking the time and effort to visit Mexico last month to get a boots on the ground perspective. On behalf of Charge John Feely, I want to convey his deep appreciation for your interest in Mexico and U.S. Mexico relations. I am not here today to lay blame, point the finger, or assign punishment. That will be for others to determine. I am simply here to discuss these events as I know them and let the committee and the American people know what the ATF Mexico Country Office, referred to as the MCO, knew and when we knew it. During my 22-year career with ATF, I proudly spent 15 years as a street agent investigating violent crime and gun trafficking, and the last seven supervising others doing the same. I am a recipient of the U.S. Attorney General's Award for Excellent in Law Enforcement, two ATF Distinguished Service Medals, and two Medals of Valor. I mention this not to boast, but to illustrate my recognized dedication to ATF and public service. I paid my dues. I can say with authority that walking guns is not a recognized ATF investigative technique. These guns went to ruthless criminals. U.S. law enforcement and our Mexican partners will be recovering these guns for a long time to come as they continue to turn up at crime scenes in Mexico and the United States. It infuriates me that people, including my law enforcement, diplomatic and military colleagues, may be killed or injured with these weapons. In my professional opinion, this investigative strategy was flawed and was allowed to continue due to ineffective oversight in the Phoenix Field Division and possibly beyond. It is alleged that over 2,000 guns were trafficked in this investigation. To put that in context, upon information and belief, the U.S. Army 75th Ranger Regiment has approximately 2,500 Rangers. That means that, a that as a result of this investigation, the Sinaloa cartel may have received almost as many guns that are needed to arm the entire regiment. Out of these 2,000 weapons, 34 were 50 caliber sniper rifles. That is approximately the number of sniper rifles a Marine Infantry Regiment takes into battle. That is 3,000 men. For the MCO, this case was one of the many ATF traffic investigations with a U.S.-Mexico nexus. I would like to inform this committee and the American public that I believe what happened here was inexcusable and we in Mexico had no part in it. We were aware of this investigation, but we were never aware of the policy to walk guns in this investigation. So as these questions have surfaced, I have become aware that critical details were deliberately kept from the MCO as well as ATF's Office of Strategic Intelligence. I have reason to believe that we were kept in the dark because the ATF leadership in Phoenix feared that we would tell our Mexican partners. Reasonable people can disagree on investigative techniques, but there is no room for walking guns. This goes against